Sam Seidel is the author of Hip Hop Genius, Remixing High School Education, and he's here today with his co-authors of the book, uh, Dr. Michael Lipset and Tony Simmons, the co-founder of the St. Paul, Minnesota's Hip Hop High. So please welcome Sam, Michael, and Tony to the South by Southwest Studio Live. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to have you guys here today. I've, yeah. I've, been, I've been really interested about their book, <laughs> Hip Hop Genius 2.0. So there's a 1.0. There's a, yeah, there's an original <laughs> edition. It came out 10 years ago, so this is the 10th anniversary edition. Okay, and so you've uh, brought in some co-authors on this one. Yeah, yeah, it was always the plan on the first one actually to co-write it, um, but as, as things went at that time, folks were busy and I ended up just pressing all the keys. Um, but it was fun to be able to come back 10 years later and do it the way we had wanted to do it the first time around, which was to, to really have it be more of a collective effort. So explain the concept of Hip Hop Genius, um, how it encompasses more than just using rap music to teach. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really central to it. So uh, when we say Hip Hop Genius, what we're talking about is what we call creative resourcefulness in the face of limited resources, um, or as it's often said in the hip hop community, flipping something out of nothing. And we feel and have felt and feel now more than ever that that is desperately needed in the world of education, really in our whole society and globe, um, but definitely in the world of K-12 education where we, we do face limited resources and we have big changes that we need to make. Um, and the students that our systems continue to fail uh, over and over um, are the same young people who created hip hop culture. And so we believe that looking to black young people, to brown young folks in urban areas and all over the globe at this point, um, looking to youth culture, looking to the brilliance of young people is a source of the answers that everyone in K-12 seems to be seeking. Um, and so that's really what this book is about, is, is saying what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like in practice? And Tony, you lead St. Paul, Minnesota's famous high school for recording artists, AKA Hip Hop High. Um, yes. 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 <laughs> talk about what you're doing currently and how you're putting Hip Hop Genius into practice. Sure. First, I want to say, um, you know, three of us are here. Um, we had a tragic loss recently, and I just want to say that just because I really want to honor um, our family member, Hip Hop Genius family member, as well as my family family member, um, Rab Bakari. Um, he really embodied everything that we're talking about and just an incredible individual um, family member. And, you know, his loss is, is of great um, sorrow to us. But for us, hip hop is really just a very natural, organic way to engage young people. We believe so strongly that their brilliance is really where you should start in terms of having a, um, an educational program. Mm -hmm. And David T. C. Ellis, who's the founder of High School for Recording Arts, had a recording studio after recording with Prince, world famous Prince. Yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, um, and over time, young people were showing up at his studio every day, one, wanting to know how to get into the music business, but he realized they weren't in school. And he would say, why aren't you in school? And they say, well, school's boring, or I got kicked out. And um, but we really want to learn about the music business. You, you know, you've made it. What can, what can we learn? And he was like, these young people are brilliant. They're, they're passionate and they're ready to learn. Why aren't they in school? Why isn't the school system recognizing, you know, the things that I'm seeing? So he created the High School for Recording Arts. I had the honor to be there with him. And to this day, we base our school around that concept of them coming into a recording studio feeling like they're engaging in a business, but connecting core learning um, subjects to that creative journey that they take, and really giving them the space, the agency, the opportunity to have their voices heard, the opportunity to have hands-on experiential experiences. And, um, and we do that through a project-based you know, process where they make real-world um, projects. You know, it might be a CD, it might be a campaign, and it's been, uh, uh, like Sam is saying, just a very effective way to engage young people who've normally been marginalized and oppressed through society. And the education system has kind of tossed aside. So, um, you know, for us, and Sam kind of coined this, we don't teach hip hop, we are hip hop. I love that. So you're taking, you know, think core subjects they need to learn and making it real relatable and real life yes. for them. Yes, yes. And one thing I would add is that 
The High School for Recording Arts was never started as Hip Hop High, right? It was started by T.C. Ellis, who was a rap artist. Four young people who were drawn to his studio because of what they wanted to do in that studio. And Tony and T.C. both will tell anyone who asks today that the school would not be Hip Hop High if the people in it, the students and the staff, didn't identify with hip hop culture, didn't bring it naturally into their learning through their interests, passions, and creative forms of expression. And I think that that's really important to think about when others are looking at the High School for Recording Arts, perhaps for inspiration or with questions about what they do, how, why, et cetera, because it's never prescribed. It's all student-centered and it comes from that student-provided um, area of interest. Well, congratulations on the recent release of Hip Hop uh, Genius 2.0. Uh, this, this edition has many examples of successful Hip Hop Genius programs in the country. What are some of your favorites? Hmm. Great question. I mean, one thing I'll say, and I'd love to he hear both of your answers to that question. The first edition of the book came out about 10 years into the High School for Recording Arts um, existence, and so it really told a lot of stories up to that point. Um, told the story of David T.C. Ellis founding the school, as Tony was just describing, um, and a lot of stories of the, basically the first decade of the school's existence, from selling CDs in the school vending machines because students were wanting to burn their, their you know, projects right away, to all access record, you know, studio passes that students would earn to get time in a real recording studio, to um, courses that focused around you know, an entire course that one teacher was teaching around the TV show, The Wire, which was hot at the time. Oh, I'm a fan um, of that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I mean, all that was incredible and all that was a little dated by this point, right? Yeah. Like who you, who's burning stuff on CD at this point? So um, one of the exciting things about getting to come back in 10 years later, the school's 22 or so years into its tenure is just how much more innovation has happened in that time that, the, that these two guys really helped capture. Um, and also particularly how the school has responded to some of the major um, challenges and opportunities that have come up in the last decade. Um, or even just in the last couple of years, there's some, been some incredible challenges. Exactly. Have you guys handled that? Yeah, so maybe that's a good place for you two to jump in and share some specifics from the last couple of years. There's been a couple sure. roadblocks for education. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, to go back to your original question, which organizations are we inspired by in the world of hip-hop based education now in 2022 I think there's a, a number that do deserve being mentioned because we learn from them they learn from us and the community is strong and that begins with Martha Diaz and the Universal Hip Hop Museum her community which is the first online uh, hip-hop based education program um, hip-hop architecture um, there is Reagan Summer McCoy's like Hip Hop Hacks, I believe, is her camp where she's designing STEAM learning programs like uh, drum machine building kits with students, coding, amazing stuff is happening all over the globe. Um, and a lot of it, because of what Hip Hop Genius is, flipping something out of nothing, comes from this space of a lack of resources. And in the last couple of years, we've certainly experienced that firsthand. And I would love, Tony, for you to come in and talk about what that's been like because, you know, High School for Recording Arts is in St. Paul, right on University Avenue, Midway. We were nine miles from where George Floyd was murdered. Um, the uprising that was triggered as a response was right outside our front doors, and so. Yeah, and you know, when you give young people a voice to really look at their community and want to respond to it, and you give them the space to do that, you could find examples of that that doesn't even explicitly think that they're or call themselves doing hip-hop. I think about the young people in P Parkland, Florida, you know, after that horrific shooting, yet those young people were able to come together within their school, um, raise awareness, organize in that incredible um, showing in Washington, D.C., bring young people from all over the, the country and the globe together for a cause. That's hip-hop to us. So it transcends race, it transcends you know, um, social economic status, it's really about empowering young people. So you know, like Michael said, um, when George Floyd was murdered, you know, we had to respond to that because our young people were hurting. And um, they know at a school like High School for Recording Arts or any place that gives them that opportunity to have their voices be heard, um, they were able to authentically show up, express their feelings, 
think about with our teachers and our advisors how to create um, not only something that may be healing to them, but also learning. And not only just learning, but also teaching. So, you know, to their community and wider. So, um, so that's what we do. And it's, it really lends itself to young people really feeling empowered and being able to take that with them beyond high school so that they could become change agents that we, that we all really need. And being able to control your own narrative through yes, art absolutely. has to be so incredibly empowering. You guys must be inspired constantly by the kids around you. Yes, yes. And the world can be inspired because we have a student-run record label, the longest in the country, um, called Another Level Records. And if you go to Spotify and you search High School for Recorded Arts, I will Arts, be doing this. <laughs> you'll, see, you'll hear 20 years of some of the most incredible music and creativity on our YouTube channel, videos. Um, these young people are incredibly creative but you know we know that creativity is the 21st century currency and it really transcends even music you know once they learn how to be build their creative confidence as you know what sam does at the d school and helping people do you know that could translate to anything that they do so um you know for us that's what it's really all about so now that hip hop learning programs have been around for two decades i mean you must have quantifiable results that you can look at. Mm -hmm. And Michael actually did some research. <laughs> so how are they working? Uh, doctor, let's yeah, say. That's <laughs> yes. it. So doctor? <laughs> it's, it's part of my responsibility as the director of social impact. I mean, one of the things that is so important at the high school for recording arts is understanding how to measure our students' success in an appropriate way. Because so many schools are dealing with students that one might imagine as the norm or the average. Whereas we exist and have existed from the start of our school to serve young people who've been pushed and kicked out of other schools. So actually during the summer of 2020, kind of at the height of the pandemic, we did a youth participatory action research project with our students. They were interviewing each other as researchers and research participants. Um, and we found that our average student had been to four and a half other schools before enrolling at the high school for recording arts, but spending, and those are high schools, it's not even yeah. middle or elementary, but they're spending more time at any, at the High School for Recording Arts and at any other school. Um, we have a one-year graduation rate that we track as a result because the traditional four-year graduation rate doesn't work at our school. We don't have students for four years at a time. And 98% of our students eligible to graduate within a year are graduating, which we find to be super powerful for those students. 100% of those students have an acceptance letter in hand by the time they graduate to some form of post-secondary education. Um, we also know that in a given year, 65% of our new enrollees have been in touch with the criminal injustice system in some way, shape, or form. Good way to put it. And a number that drops to 13% by the time they graduate. That is so, incredible. What was the before and after number again? 65 down to 13. Wow. And so, um, there's been research done on our school that shows we're actively disrupting the school to prison pipeline, putting students on the path towards lifelong learning journeys, and we're uh, just happy to be able to do that kind of work. So how are you going to scale this so we can get it <laughs> everywhere? Because that sounds like a disruption that the rest of us need. It's a great question. It is. It do is. you have plans to scale? Well, I should say we realize after 20 years of, of success that we believe we've been able to achieve. Uh, with the young people we serve that we could do that pretty much anywhere um, in terms of young, urban young people who've been pushed or kicked out of the system based on the principles we've been to talking about. Uh, so we've had people throughout that time coming and visiting our school, wanting to know how to um, recreate programs like ours, asking if we could bring our programs there. So we created a new organization called For Learning so forlearning.com or four-learning.org. The number four. The number four, yes. Where we're actually now um, doing just that. Um, we have um, relationships in California and Wisconsin and New York. Chicago. Uh, Chicago. Um, and we're looking to grow because for us, um, we don't believe that any young person who isn't maximizing their potential and the opportunities that should fall unto them um, should um, not have that. So um, we're committed to that and we're ready to bring that um, with our incredible team of educators from around the country. And not just relationships in those cities, we're actively working with five, I'm sorry, six schools across the country right now 
in supporting them in standing up their own recording arts programs um, for student learning. I mean, did you guys have to go virtual or close down? What happened during pandemic? Did that, that was a little bit of a hiccup. Were you able to still maintain your students? Yes, yeah. um, we, we, like practically everyone, had to go virtual. Um, yet um, we were able to be successful in maintaining our enrollment and even increasing our attendance based on the fact that at our core, we're about relationships. Uh, we have an advisory model. Every student has a personal learning plan. Every student has a personal advisor. And we have an incredible student support team. So when the pandemic hit and we went into remote learning, um, our, our team was still in the community, connecting with young people, giving them the supports that they need, giving them the technology and the access to um, the internet, um, and maintaining those relationships. We called it distance, but not disconnected. Nice. You know, we we maintained that, and and it proved to be you know um, fruitful because we, like I said, we were able to not lose any young people. And I think that deserves a little more emphasis because at a time when nationwide schools were struggling to maintain enrollment and attendance, the High School for Recording Arts maintained its enrollment throughout the pandemic, all both years, this year, last year, and also increased attendance in a way that is kind of indicative of the fact that to serve young people who've been so pushed in, to the margins of education, the High School for Recording Arts already had to do a lot of the things that then other schools needed to start doing for the first time right. throughout the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the keys is yeah. that when you've built for 20 so or so years a program that is fundamentally responsive to young people's needs, whatever those yeah. might be in a given moment, yeah. you're ready for a moment like this. When you've run a school for however long that's like one size fits all, we're just going to do it our way and kids can either get down or get out. Yep. It's a lot harder of a pivot when something comes up like this to figure out what to do or to even have the will to do or to build the culture to do. And, and so it doesn't surprise me, right, like that here we are two years into the mm -hmm. pandemic and y'all are having the results that you were having at the school where like so many folks have had such a hard time. I think part of it is dispositional as well, because I recall a very particular moment at the beginning of the pandemic when Tony led the entire school team in a meeting by saying, we need to look at these next two years as though we're gonna be coming out stronger. What can we do now to improve our systems so that we actually come out on the other end better than we were before? Whereas I think a lot of other schools were kind of stymied by the moment and it's totally an understandable response. Um, but I definitely credit Tony and the leadership at the school with saying, no, we're not gonna allow that in this moment, we're gonna come out just, than we were. just a little note that ties back to the book off of what Michael, it doesn't surprise me to hear that story. There's a whole chapter in this new version mm -hmm. about Tony's leadership style. Mm -hmm. And in the first version, which is also included in here, a whole chapter about David T.C. Ellis's leadership style. Because when we're talking about hip hop education, there's nothing wrong with bringing rap lyrics into a classroom. I was a high school English teacher. I did a lot of that. But we're talking about something much bigger. We're talking mm -hmm. about what it looks like to design schools as in a hip hop way. Um, we're looking at what hip hop pedagogy means, a hip hop style of teaching and learning, and also hip hop leadership. What does it mean to be a hip hop leader? And so by profiling David and then Tony, we're trying to like bring that to the surface with very concrete examples and stories that help folks who might be interested in how, how can I bring a hip hop element to my leadership, even if whether, whatever my relationship has been with hip hop culture in the past, um, we wanna provide some, some tangible examples that people can sample and remix. So positive and solution oriented. <laughs> it's very inspiring. Well, okay, let me ask you this. Many rap songs include lyrics that are misogynistic and homophobic. How do you incorporate positive messages of hip hop while leaving offensive messages behind? And do you see offensive lyrics as teaching moments sure. or is it just art? Sure. You know, for us, it's, it's really about we want young people to be able to express, right? And we know whenever an artist express, sometimes they may say things that are provocative. It's not just hip hop that has offensive mm -hmm. words. It's not just hip hop that has maybe even a misogynistic storyline because hip hop is really about storytelling. It's, it's, it's about them being able to express. But for us as a learning institute, you know, we built HSRA around values and it would co-create it and co-support it with our young people. And it was, re and for us as family respect, community education, even though it came up with David, our founders, you know, had spontaneously, he was still 
inspired by the young people and the young people have accepted those values. So when they create, um, they're creating not knowing that they're not gonna say anything that they feel is gonna do violence to those values. And that has been the case throughout. Um, you know, you'll, you'll hear songs that at one end um, is really, you know, telling a, a true raw story, mm -hmm. but it's really accessible to any audience who's who wants to listen. So again, if anyone were to go to Spotify, yeah, they could they 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 would see that you know these young people really um, are representing those values. Well, I am looking forward to my new playlist of positive <laughs> hip hop messaging. Yes, very quick fire round. If you could have one rapper come to your schools, who would it be? Melly Mel, Justin Bay. Black thought. All right, on that, Tony, Sam, and Michael, thank you for stopping by the studio today. I am truly inspired by what you guys have been able to accomplish, and I look forward to just checking everything out on my Spotify. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And there's a weekly conversation, hashtag hip hop ed on Twitter, so folks who are interested in this, interested in that last question you asked, and how to engage young people in positive ways, highly recommend joining thank you. Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern. I will. You can see the schedule for all our upcoming interviews at southbysouthwestedu.com slash studio. And if you can find all those studio interviews on the South by Southwest EDU TV app available on Apple TV, Roku, Android TV, Amazon Fire, and on iOS and Android mobile devices. You gotta have one of those, right? Mm -hmm.